In 1989, a female Marine captain disappeared from her quarters without a trace. Known for her exemplary conduct, her colleagues found it hard to believe that she'd gone AWOL. Military authorities suspected she'd fallen victim to foul play. The FBI joined the investigation. They would find the decorated officer or bring her a second to justice. Shirley Russell was a determined woman, determined enough to reach the rank of captain in the United States Marine Corps. When this decorated officer turned up missing, her colleagues refused to believe she'd gone AWOL. It was unclear whether Captain Shirley Russell was dead or alive. I'm Jim Kalstrom, former head of the FBI's New York office. When a crime is committed on a military installation, it falls under federal jurisdiction. Agents would have to rely on their dedication and instinct to solve the mystery of her disappearance. The Marine Corps base at Quantico, Virginia is located 35 miles south of Washington, D.C. Since 1917, it has been headquarters to one of the nation's most selective branches of the military. Over 3,000 Marines train, work, and live on the 100 square mile base. Nearly everything in civilian life is mirrored on base, from department stores to housing. Married officers have the option of living on base in married officers' quarters, which are known as MOQ. For six months, MOQ number 394D was the home of Captain Shirley Gibbs Russell and her husband, Robert Russell. By January 1989, Captain Russell decided to end the marriage. For the next month, she would stay with a friend off base until bachelor's housing was available. Shirley packed her civilian clothes, her uniforms, and her Marine issue firearm. Robert begged her to stay, but Shirley was determined. For her, the move was fine. For Robert, the separation meant he had to move off base. As a former Marine, he would be losing his last tie to the Corps. Captain Russell continued to advance in her career as the adjutant to the commanding officer of the support battalion at the Marine Basic School. She was in charge of all personnel matters and administrative needs of the support battalion. She was known as a dedicated Marine by her peers and by her commanding officer, Lieutenant Colonel James Hodges. When I first met Shirley Russell, I was very impressed with the fact that she was a black female captain because we just don't have that many in the Marine Corps and that she had come from a poor background and was making something of herself, and she seemed so energized and so eager to, uh, to keep moving up the, uh, the, the rank uh, structure. Captain Russell? While assigned together, they built a friendship based on mutual respect. I can't talk to you right now. Now is not a good time. Hodges knew that Shirley's marriage was in trouble. I'll have to talk to you later. My relationship with Shirley Russell was very special, in, even though that I was her commanding officer and her, her ultimate boss, if you will. I was very uh, close to her as sort of a, a big brother mentor. And she, we talked sometimes at, you know, after working hours about her situation, uh, her marriage, her past, and so forth. Thank you, sir. On Thursday, March 2nd, about a month after her split with Robert, Shirley requested leave from work. She needed to clean her former quarters and finalize her legal separation. 
Four days later, on Monday, March 6th, Hodges arrived at the office, expecting to find Shirley at her desk. He was surprised to find her office empty. Shirley had a perfect work record. She had never been late to report. And when I walked in the door, I asked uh, Major Buck Bourgeois right away, and I said, where's Shirley? And he said, sir, she's not here. And instantly, I felt like, oh no, something has happened to her. Lieutenant Colonel Hodges investigated the unauthorized absence. Captain Russell had recently moved into bachelor officer's quarters on base. Hodges hoped he would find her at home. Captain Russell. Captain Russell. As the missing captain's commanding officer, Hodges had authorization to search the room. Captain Russell. There was no sign of her, and no indication she had moved out. The Marines returned to the office and contacted the captain's husband, who now lived off base. Hodges knew that Robert Russell had helped Shirley clean and paint their vacated quarters over the weekend. They arranged to meet at the couple's former MOQ. The Marine officers inspected the residence. Russell told them that he and Shirley had met here around noon on Saturday to do some touch-up painting. According to Russell, Shirley volunteered to buy some paint from the base exchange at about 1.30. He claimed that she didn't take her car, but walked to the PX instead. Russell said he hadn't seen her since. Lieutenant Colonel Hodges didn't believe Robert Russell's story. It hit me as just totally a lie because the PX was probably four or five miles away. And there's no way in the world that she would have walked to the PX from their quarters. Outside the quarters, the officers also inspected Russell's storage shed. On the floor, Colonel Hodges noticed a rust-colored stain. Russell dismissed it as paint. Hodges was skeptical. He was no expert, but to him, it looked like blood. Lieutenant Colonel Hodges briefed the Naval Investigative Service. The NIS reported the possibility of a crime to the FBI's Washington Field Office. The NIS briefed special agents on the case. Captain Russell had been missing for three days. With no indication of her whereabouts, the agents followed standard procedure. Special Agent Alan Malinchak headed the case. When you have somebody missing, you either have a, uh, a case of an abduction, uh, you have a case of uh, a missing person, somebody who's walked away uh, for whatever reason, or you uh, have foul play. So the initial investigation that the FBI was involved in ran all three of those uh, investigative lines. Ms. Russell? According to standard procedure, procedure, the missing woman's husband, Robert Russell, was the first to be questioned. Thank you very much. He told agents that he was talking with a neighbor around 1.30 the afternoon of Shirley's disappearance when a friend of hers stopped by to pick her up for lunch. At 3.30, Robert said he called her bachelor officer's quarters to see if she had gone home. The duty clerk had not seen Captain Russell, so Robert left a message. Around 4 p.m., Robert borrowed his housemate's car and drove to Pennsylvania to spend the weekend with his parents. 
personally threatened by this? Or did you wait for During the first interview that I had with Robert Russell, he was uh, very calm, very businesslike, uh, wanted to assist the FBI in the investigation and provided me with multiple uh, uh, locations of where Shirley might be, who she may be associated with, what could have happened. Midnight phone calls. Russell thought it was possible someone had abducted or harmed her. Though Shirley had no enemies, the couple had experienced some trouble due to their interracial marriage. Russell told agents he and his wife frequently visited his hometown near Mahanoy City, Pennsylvania. One afternoon, while shopping, the Russells were harassed by racists. According to her husband, Shirley had been frightened, but another incident scared her even more. Unidentified men had called their house on base. Hello? The caller used racial epithets and threatened to harm the couple. How'd you get my Whoever the caller was knew where the Russells lived. After the threatening phone calls, Robert told officials he felt Shirley might need protection for the times he couldn't be with her. shop near base. Robert picked out a 25 caliber Raven semi-automatic just two days before Shirley disappeared. Russell told agents he surprised Shirley with a gift on the day they met to clean their former quarters. According to Russell, Shirley was appreciative of the pearl-handled weapon. Thank you. Agents were suspicious of the story. As a Marine captain, Shirley already had a personal sidearm. If she felt unsafe, why would she need another gun? With Shirley and the gun nowhere to be found, that question would be difficult to answer. Marine Captain Shirley Gibbs Russell had vanished from base housing on March 4th, 1989. Her husband was the last person to have seen her. Agents needed to corroborate his story. The FBI interviewed Marine Captain Patrice Gale. According to Robert Russell, on the day Shirley disappeared, Captain Gale had arrived at Shirley's former residence to pick her up for lunch at about 1.30. Gail confirmed this. Robert also told her that Shirley had gone for paint and hadn't returned. Captain Gale thought this was odd. Shirley never missed appointments. And this one had been especially important. Just a day earlier, Gail had accompanied Shirley to the base legal office to pick up her separation papers. Shirley planned to present them to Robert the day they painted their former quarters. This would make their separation official, and Shirley worried about Robert's reaction. Afterwards, she would need a friend to talk to and ask Captain Gale to meet her. When Shirley failed to show up, Captain Gale worried that Robert had done something to her friend. FBI agents checked Shirley's bachelor officer's quarters. The clerk had not seen her since Saturday, March 4th, the day she disappeared. On that same Saturday, Corporal Dan Carroway confirmed that Robert Russell had called looking for his wife. The corporal noted the time in his logbook is 3.30 p.m. About a half hour after he took the message, 
Caraway thought he saw Captain Russell. She was talking on the telephone. He recalled that she was wearing jeans and a maroon sweater. He wanted to give her the message that her husband had called, but he was distracted. By the time Caraway was free, the woman he thought was Captain Shirley Russell was gone. His description contradicted Robert Russell's statement that Shirley had been wearing a blue jogging outfit. The corporal also only saw the woman from behind. He never got a good look at her face. Agents doubted if she ever returned to her apartment. They found no trace that Shirley had changed her clothes or brought back the separation papers. Investigators questioned Russell's old neighbors. One of them said she saw a blue station wagon backed up to the Russell's shed on the day Shirley had disappeared. She noted the time was 5 p.m. This was an hour later than Russell claimed he left for Pennsylvania. Investigators wondered if Robert Russell was mistaken or lying. Agent Alan Malinchek called the FBI in Pennsylvania to pin down Russell's whereabouts the rest of that day. Special Agent Michael Quirk of the Allentown office became co-case agent. He contacted Robert's parents. Robert Russell had traveled to uh, St. Clair, Pennsylvania on March 4th, 1989 and he uh, stayed with his family the, uh, the weekend of, of March 4th, uh, March 5th. FBI interviews with Russell's family confirmed he had arrived alone. None of them had seen Shirley. The FBI launched a media campaign seeking the public's help. Captain Shirley Gibbs Russell's photo was featured in television and newspaper stories leads began to pour in. Midway between Quantico and Robert Russell's hometown, a clerk in York, Pennsylvania called federal authorities. The clerk reported that a young black woman had been in the store on the afternoon of Saturday, March 4th, the day Captain Shirley Gibbs Russell disappeared from Quantico. According to the clerk, the woman bought several items and paid with a check. The clerk asked the woman for identification. She produced a military ID card. She resembled photos the clerk had seen in the newspaper. Okay. Do you mind if I look at your bank receipts? The agent asked to see the checks received on that day. He found that none of them were written by Shirley Gibbs Russell. Assistant U.S. Attorney Lawrence Lizer worked with the FBI on the case. He noted another detail that suggested the woman in the store was not Captain Russell. The color of the ID and the location of the picture in the ID described as belonging to Shirley Russell was the ID of a dependent military person, not of an active duty military person. There had been no activity since March 4th in Captain Russell's bank or credit card accounts, nor had she called her family or friends. Considering Shirley's stable character, her disappearance didn't make sense to Agent Alan Malinchik. She was the type of person who was going to do very well in the Marine Corps. Um, she would be promoted. Um, she had that capability. She was sharp. She was uh, squared away. She easy to make friends. Everybody that worked with her liked her. She had a lot of stability in her life with regard to church and family. Um, for her to just disappear of her own accord uh, just didn't make any logical sense. With no word from her or a kidnapper, agents believed it was likely that Captain Shirley Gibbs Russell was dead. They were now searching for her body. Dozens of Marines fanned out across the huge base. They searched hundreds of acres of dense woods the Marines used for training. They found no trace of the missing captain. 
Perhaps Robert Russell knew more about his wife's disappearance than he was telling the FBI. Agents asked him to submit to a polygraph examination. He agreed. That the last time you saw her, you were painting your quarters, and it was sometime prior to 3 p.m. on Saturday, March 4th? That's correct. As before, agents found him to be cool and cooperative. For almost three hours, Robert Russell answered dozens of questions relating to Shirley's whereabouts. Mr. Russell, could you advise me where you... He was subjected to three separate exams. Was this red spot paint, Mr. Russell? Yes, it was. Each time, Robert Russell was found to be deceptive. When agents told him the results, Russell seemed unfazed, almost smug. He even consented to be fingerprinted. Perhaps he was aware that polygraphs were inadmissible in a federal court of law. Without a body, agents would need something stronger than a hunch to prove that Russell had killed his wife and disposed of her. In the spring of 1989, the FBI continued to hunt for the body of Marine Captain Shirley Gibbs Russell. In their search for answers, agents delved deeper into the background of their prime suspect, her husband, Robert Russell. Special Agent Michael Quirk learned that Russell was already married before he met Shirley. He had two children with his first wife, Pam. The marriage only lasted six years. In 1986, Russell told his wife that he wanted a divorce. He left Pam and their children on Christmas Day. Six months later, Robert married Shirley while they were both stationed at Paris Island, South Carolina. The FBI learned that Shirley was transferred to Quantico a short time later. They also learned that Robert told friends that the distance was hurting his marriage. He claimed he was leaving the Marine Corps to join Shirley and Quantico in order to stabilize their relationship. But agents discovered a different motive for the move. Agents believed it was unlikely Robert would voluntarily relinquish his rank as captain. Being in the Marine Corps was Robert's whole life and whole world. Military records showed that in February of 1988, while stationed at Gulfport, Mississippi, Robert's superiors found that his passion for the Corps did not seem to apply to its regulations. They issued Robert a less than honorable discharge for dereliction of duty and defrauding the government. He was escorted out of his office and was prohibited from taking anything with him except his own clothing. Although Robert was no longer a Marine, he moved into officers' quarters at Quantico based on Shirley's rank of captain. While Shirley supported him, Robert tried to get his life back on track by becoming a teacher at a nearby high school. But his drinking started to become excessive. He was getting drunk more often, staying out later. Robert? Shirley was distraught. She joined al a support group for the loved ones of alcoholics. When Robert became physically abusive, Shirley finally left him. Assistant U.S. Attorney Lawrence Lizard believed that Robert's problems left Shirley few alternatives. She realized that marriage was, was going nowhere, began to get counseling from a local counseling center that was made available to uh, members of the Marine Corps. She also consulted with a um, Navy lawyer to begin the divorce process. 
To investigators, Russell's instability and abusive behavior reinforced their belief that he was capable of killing Shirley. His personality could not tolerate the fact that this black woman, his wife, was a Marine Corps captain who was successful, who was succeeding in her, her career, and to top it all off, wanted to divorce him. Agents learned that during her separation, Shirley had sought refuge off base with her close friend, fellow Marine Captain Ann Mack. Captain Mack told Agent Malinchek that Shirley was afraid of her husband. She intended to leave him, but needed a place to stay. She had asked Captain Ann Mack if she could stay with her at her townhome in the Springfield, Virginia area, and uh, Captain Ann Mack uh, agreed and uh, laid out some ground rules about uh, Bob Russell not being there, uh, not coming into the house, uh, uh, nothing like that whatsoever. But it was not enough to keep Robert away from Shirley. Mack was worried about her. Mack told investigators that Robert was stalking Shirley. On several occasions, he showed up at the house early in the morning as Shirley was leaving. He harassed his wife until she agreed to spend some time with him. Mack said that Robert Russell was living off base. He had moved in with one of his new colleagues. An FBI agent checked the address. It was the home of Sandy Flint. Sandy Flint offered little. She said she knew nothing about Robert's missing wife. On the way out, the agent met Robert Flint, Sandy's father-in-law. He was a retired painter who had worked at the base at Quantico for 10 years. Mr. Flint told the agent about a conversation he had with Robert Russell two days after Shirley's disappearance. Robert Russell asked them how to clean up uh, stains from concrete floors. And the father-in-law had told Bob Russell that you could just use chlorine or soap and water and that would pretty much clean it up or dilute it. And Bob had asked him, well, what if it's blood? And, and the father-in-law had said, well, you could use muriatic acid. Mr. Flint told the agent something else of interest. Sandy and her husband had recently separated. He suspected Sandy was now having an affair with Robert Russell. With each new person agents interviewed, they found more deception from Robert Russell. If Sandy was indeed involved with Russell, she might know if he had killed Shirley. Agents would inform her it would be unwise to obstruct a federal murder case. Sandy agreed to speak with the FBI. This time, agents found her to be far more cooperative. She described her role in Robert Russell's obsession. She had admitted to having a, an intimate affair with Bob Russell while Bob Russell was still married. Um, she advised us that she, at Bob's request, she had surveilled uh, Shirley Russell. She could report to Bob uh, Shirley's activities and whereabouts. He enlisted her as his spy. Sandy told the FBI, Russell was convinced that Shirley was having an affair. He wanted to know where Shirley went and who she met. Sandy followed her everywhere, but found nothing to support his delusional fixation. And he was so compulsive, he wanted to catch his wife cheating. Of course, the irony of all of this is she wasn't cheating at all. It was he who was cheating on her. Robert was too far gone for logic. He refused to believe the assurances of his mistress. 
In his own mind, if he was cheating, so was Shirley. And he would go to any length to prove it. He told Sandy that he broke into his wife's car and planted a voice-activated recorder. When it failed to record anything incriminating, he decided he needed to get closer. Robert broke into Ann Mack's house to bug Shirley's bedroom. What happened next told Sandy that her lover's obsession had completely consumed him. Robert called his mistress from his wife's bedroom, speaking in a whisper. He won't believe where I'm at. He told Sandy he was drinking Shirley's wine and reading her journal. Then he said something she would never forget. He had informed her that if uh, Shirley comes missing, uh, it'll be me, I'll have taken care of her. And uh, she had said, we well, can't do that. Uh, you know, she's going you know, to look for her. He says, and if anybody questions you on this, uh, deny it. Uh, don't even admit to the conversation we're having now. Sandy's statements were incriminating, but it was her word against his. To corroborate her story, the FBI needed physical evidence. We requested a consent search of Captain Ann Mack's residence. And he retrieved several items, and, and some of those items, one was a telephone and one was a wine glass. And when we sent those to the FBI laboratory for analysis, we were able to develop uh, Robert Russell's fingerprints on those items. The FBI now had its first piece of physical evidence to corroborate that Robert Russell obsessively stalked his wife. But without Shirley's body, it was still not enough to charge him with murder. In March of 1989, there was little evidence to link Robert Russell to the murder of his wife, Marine Captain Shirley Gibbs Russell. Early in the investigation, agents learned the suspect had been having an affair with Sandy Flint. Flint now told the FBI more about the day Shirley Gibbs Russell disappeared. She said Robert Russell had borrowed her car, a blue station wagon, to drive to his parents' house in Pennsylvania. She remembered he left her house sometime after 4 p.m. Sandy thought this was strange because he could have used his own pickup truck. Assistant U.S. Attorney Lawrence Lizer believed Russell borrowed her car that day to transport Shirley's body to Pennsylvania. The reason he asked to use that car was because he had an open bed pickup truck. The body was still in the storage shed, and he had to dispose of the body. And he couldn't do it in an open bed pickup truck, so he borrowed the closed station wagon of his girlfriend to dispose of the body. Agents hoped to substantiate this theory. They returned to Russell's former residence, where his neighbor had seen the same blue station wagon backed up to his shed. Investigators needed to take a closer look at the floor, where Lieutenant Colonel Hodges had seen the rust-colored stain. But the stain was gone, at least on the surface. And as they were chiseling the, uh, the whitewashed pieces of the concrete up, uh, Bob Russell had asked them what's going on, and they had told him that they're taking these samples to determine what the substance is on the concrete. And uh, uh, Mr. Russell had voluntarily told them, well, I, I had cleaned that up with some muriatic acid. The FBI lab confirmed that muriatic acid was present on the concrete. The same substance that Mr. Flint had suggested Russell use to remove blood from cement. Technicians found no trace of blood or paint on the chips. What could have been a key piece of forensic evidence had been destroyed. Agents hoped Sandy Flint's car would reveal more. FBI examiners scoured the station wagon inside and out. It was unusually clean for an older car that had so recently made a round trip from Virginia to Pennsylvania. 
it turned out to be another dead end. As the investigation stalled in Virginia, Robert Russell split up with Sandy, packed his things, and moved to Pennsylvania to start a new life. The FBI's investigative focus turned north as well. Agents followed Robert's every move. They observed that while he relied on his parents for support, he was very close to his brothers, Mike and Ron. Agents approached the brothers on several occasions. Mike Russell agreed to meet with agents. He told them that the day after Robert arrived in Pennsylvania following Shirley's disappearance, Robert took Sandy Flint's station wagon to a nearby car wash. Robert and his brother thoroughly cleaned the inside of the car, vacuuming it and spraying it with deodorizer. Agents believed Robert's actions demonstrated his intent to remove any evidence that Shirley's body had been in the car. Mike Russell told agents he never saw a body. He did concede that his brother's behavior had seemed desperate since Shirley left him. Two months before she disappeared, Mike and his older brother Ron drove to Virginia to take away Robert's guns. Agent Quirk recalled that his brothers felt this was necessary to prevent Robert from hurting someone. He was depressed uh, in the fact that he was no longer in the Marine Corps, that he loved the Marine Corps. He didn't have money. He was a captain in the Marine Corps. Uh, now he's a special education teacher. Uh, Shirley had uh, removed him from her checking account, so he was having problems financially. Circumstantial evidence was mounting, but the FBI lacked one crucial piece of evidence for their case. Shirley Gibbs Russell's body. The first question was where to look. Agents learned the answer from Robert Russell's first wife, Pam. Robert's boyhood home was in Schoolkill County, a rural, mountainous region in northeastern Pennsylvania. Thousands of coal mines, mostly abandoned, are scattered throughout the rugged county. Some are hundreds of feet deep and partially filled with water. As a young man, suspect Robert Russell had spent much of his time hiking and hunting in the region. His family said he knew the place like the back of his hand. A search conducted in this terrain would be daunting, but nobody ever questioned whether it should be done. 150 people participated in the extensive ground search for Shirley Gibbs Russell in early May. Volunteers from the FBI, the Marines, the Naval Investigative Service, and the Pennsylvania State Police participated. None of them were more eager to find the missing Marine than her own peers from the United States Marine Corps. Nine helicopters and six transport trucks filled with Marines were deployed. Over three days, they searched 2,000 acres of land. They never found Captain Russell's body. Agents would soon develop a theory as to why the search was not more fruitful. Agent Quirk learned about a strange phone call Ron Russell received from his brother Robert. Robert had asked Ron if he could get him some dynamite. And uh, Robert had stated that, it, that he couldn't get dynamite in Qu at Quantico because it was too expensive. And uh, Ron had asked Robert why do, you, why do you want dynamite? And Robert's response was, I want to blow up Shirley. Ron never bought it, but agents now wondered whether Robert Russell had thrown Shirley's body into a mine shaft, then sealed her grave with an explosion. The search did yield one surprising result. 
an agent found what appeared to be the grip of a gun handle. It was sent to the Firearms and Tool Marks Unit at the FBI's lab in Washington, D.C. for analysis. By comparing the samples to hundreds of other guns, examiners determined that it was consistent with the grip of a 25 caliber Raven semi-automatic. It was the same type of gun Robert Russell had purchased from a pawn shop on March 2nd, two days before his wife disappeared. Unfortunately, the tantalizing discovery would not help with the prosecution. Agents never found Robert's fingerprints on the gun part. To prosecutors, it looked as if the ex-Marine had covered his tracks well. Without a murder weapon or a body, it would be next to impossible to convict Robert Russell of murder. Very clear. After an investigation spanning two months, two states, and thousands of man hours, the FBI was no closer to arresting their prime suspect, Robert Russell, for the murder of his wife, Marine Captain Shirley Gibbs Russell. Though agents had gathered a significant amount of circumstantial evidence, Assistant U.S. Attorney Lawrence Lizer didn't have enough physical evidence to prosecute Russell for the crime. We didn't have a body, we didn't have eyewitnesses, we didn't have weapon, and it just took a tremendous amount of investigative skill and effort to put the pieces together, to go out and search out the leads, tremendous amount of hours and energy that these FBI agents took to gather the evidence. Authorities didn't even have enough evidence to make an arrest. Agents were frustrated, as were the hundreds of Marines whose lives had been touched by Captain Shirley Russell. It was like the loss of a child or, or a, a dear friend and there was nothing you could do about it. And what frustrated me so much was she was so close to being extricated from her, her bad marriage. And for her to be uh, killed, it still bothers me to this day. I mean, it just, it's just one of those things that you just never really totally get over. It looked as if Robert Russell was going to get away with murder. But Russell's past indiscretions would come back to haunt him. He had uh... Uh, been contacted by the Naval Investigative Service at Gulfport, Mississippi, that there was uh, some evidence in a um, uh, in a locker there uh, that they had maintained from uh, when Bob was uh, discharged uh, uh, from the uh, Marine Corps, and so they sent it to us, and it turned out to be a floppy disk. It had been confiscated when Russell was relieved of duty in Mississippi, a year before Shirley Russell disappeared. For security reasons, no service member who has been relieved of duty is allowed to go through their documents after dismissal. One of Russell's former superiors found the disc and read its menu of contents. One of those items that he saw on the menu was the word murder. And he pushed the, the, the mouse for that, on that word murder, and up came 26 steps, very detailed and elaborate steps, on how Robert Peter Russell was planning the murder of Captain Shirley Gibbs. Russell's plan clearly documented his intentions. The 26 steps was a, a very revealing piece of evidence because it showed the man's state of mind, his willingness to, to even contemplate murdering another human being, let alone his wife. Step one is leave Thursday, uh, January 18th for Paris Island. Well, who is that Paris Island? Shirley Russell. Make it look as if she left. Well, that's exactly what he tried to do when he did murder his wife. And then the last thing he says is uh, uh, blame it on her own kind obviously referring to her race. This is a man who um, clearly had the, the mental wherewithal and, and intent and motivation to do this kind of act. On February 8th, 1991, 
the computer file convinced federal prosecutors to bring charges against Robert Peter Russell for the murder of his wife, Captain Shirley Gibbs Russell. Ironically, Russell was arrested in a prison. Need your stuff with us. He had recently taken a job as a substance abuse counselor at Pennsylvania's Graterford State Correctional Institution. New York got a jack. But prosecution would not be easy. Assistant U.S. Attorney Lawrence Lizer would have to assemble all the pieces of circumstantial evidence like a mosaic. Hopefully, the jury would see the portrait of a killer emerge. Assistant U.S. Attorney and co-prosecutor Michael Rich would help to prepare the case against Russell. It was clear they were going to have to make it on, you know, circumstantial evidence. Uh, a, a lot of that circumstantial evidence was uh, as a result of what Bobby Russell had been saying and doing since his wife's disappearance in eight, 1989. So. It, the plan was to assemble all that into some sort of coherent scheme and present that. Never before had the federal government attempted to try someone for first degree murder based solely on circumstantial evidence. At trial, the prosecution asserted that Robert Russell intended to commit murder when he bought the 25 caliber Raven semi-automatic on March 2nd. Sweet, how much? Several of his co-workers reported that he had told them a 25 caliber is a perfect weapon. It leaves little evidence behind. He said there is virtually no blood spatter, and the bullet usually lodges in the body. On Saturday, March 4th, when Shirley gave him the separation papers, he refused to sign. Just after noon that day, the prosecution believed Robert Russell snuck up on Shirley in the shed. He had to wait for nightfall before he could remove the body. To establish an alibi, he talked with a neighbor and lied to Shirley's friend about his wife walking to the base exchange to buy paint. Okay, that's probably a good idea. See. Around 4 p.m., he went to Sandy Flint's house and borrowed her station wagon. After night fell, he wrapped Shirley's body in a tarp and placed it in the back of the car. Their neighbors saw it backed up to the shed. four hours to St. Clair, Pennsylvania with the body in the back of the car. Once there, he knew exactly where to go. There were hundreds of abandoned mines to choose from. Then, Robert Russell, who had once sworn to uphold honor as a member of the Marine Corps, dumped his wife's body into a mine shaft. He threw dynamite in to bury the evidence under thousands of pounds of rock. The jurors were convinced. On May 3rd, 1991, Robert Peter Russell was convicted of murdering his wife, Shirley Gibbs Russell. Robert Russell was sentenced to life. There is no parole in the federal system. He will never leave prison alive.